Okay. So, um, hi everybody. My name is Carly, like I said, and um, I am joining you all here from the unceded, unsurrendered, and stolen lands of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh, um, known uh, colonially as Vancouver. And um, I do want to take a second at the beginning of this session to recognize the moment that we are in. Um, we are in a moment of a lot of grief in Indigenous communities um, as we uh, looked at the Truth and Reconciliation Day that last week or the week before, um, and recently uh, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. And all over um, the world, Indigenous communities are both being targeted, but also standing up in strength um, to protect the land and the water for all the humans and the non-humans who rely on it. So I want to recognize that um, we, I am here in solidarity and XR Vancouver stands in solidarity with Indigenous communities uh, for sovereignty and for land back. And um, I, I want to express great appreciation for, um, for the communities that have taught me things um, and I hope I continue to learn and act in, um, in good faith as an ally. Um, if anybody else would like to uh, introduce themselves with their land, uh, where they're um, coming from, I feel welcome you to do that in the chat. Uh, but I also want to start us off with doing a quick check-in. So this is a normal, like, or one of the things that we do within XR Vancouver um, and Extinction Rebellion Worldwide is to check in at the beginning of uh, meetings and workshops uh, to just see how we're feeling, how we are showing up in our um, in our workshops or in our sessions. Um, so I can start and then after that, I wanna open it up to anybody who wants to just unmute themselves, um, say how they're feeling today, just like one to two sentences about how you're feeling and how you're showing up today. Um, you can also feel free to do it in the chat if you prefer. So I am feeling a little bit frazzled today, but overall pretty good. Um, so I'm showing up here with a, a decent amount of energy tonight. Would anybody else, else like to introduce themselves and check in? Janice, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Janice. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. And yeah, I'm feeling really good. I've, I've listened to uh, the NVD training a couple of times. And I have to say, uh, every time I am here, I get a little more out of it. Thanks. Thank you, Janice. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, Alondra? Hi, yeah, I'm Alondra. Um, I use she, they pronouns. And yeah, I'm really excited. I've been to Fairy Creek a few times now. I've been arrested a handful of times and I am really craving this knowledge for the next time I am face-to-face -face with our enforcement people. So thank you so much for holding this. I'm really excited. Great, thank you. Dorothy, go ahead. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Dorothy. I use she/her pronouns. I'm coming to this training with nervous, excited energy. Um, this is my first training of sorts with XR. I spent a bit of time at Fairy Creek recently, so um, excited to be learning more about how I can step up and, and support, but also just a little nervous because I don't know anyone here, and I'm excited to, yeah, see what's in store. Amazing, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, I see someone's hand up. Yeah, Kathy, go ahead. Hi, I'm Kathy Code. I've been with the, uh, the movement since uh, August, 2020. I'm part of the legal team, uh, part of the media team. So yeah, just, it's been a long year. Um, We've had some some minor victories. Um, I'm just feeling a little tired right now, but I'm still ever hopeful. I am just so proud of of the people in our movement uh, who have maintained such discipline and such a um, um, such a wonderful approach to this whole movement. Thank you for sharing. All right, well, oh, yeah, Denitza. 
Hi everyone, I'm Denitza. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm gonna say that I feel aligned because I'm finally at the first meeting with you all, and I'm mm -hmm. just all aligned. All right, go for it, Carly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just so everybody knows, if anybody ever sees some of us doing this, this is our like um, XR way of showing agreement and uh, sort of support for whoever's talking. Um, so throughout this session today, um, I do want to encourage people to um, ask questions. We will keep our questions until the end of the session, but if at any point you want to throw them into the chat, you are totally welcome to do that. And um, then we can um, we can put that into the end. Um, so with that, I want to pass it over to um, Thane, who's going to give us a bit of a, oh, actually, maybe before I do that, I'll tell you what our session is going to be tonight. So we are going to start off um with uh talking about the importance of nonviolence and civil disobedience from zane um we are also going to talk a little bit about what to expect um we can talk a little bit about fairy creek and then we are going to move into some legal briefings um and then um at the end we're also going to do some testimonials and i'm going to talk more about what to expect when getting arrested here in vancouver so with that i'm going to pass it over to zane um who is going to talk a little while on why getting arrested is um, important in civil disobedience. Yeah, I was just panicking because I didn't know if uh, Rick was going to make it. He's our lawyer, but he will. Uh, so after I'm done, he's going to talk about the legal situation and what happens during the arrest process and and like how the whole court process is like, what the charges are and all of that. But just before I talk about this, I, I should just mention very briefly what the science is right now because not because people don't know i'm sure everyone knows but just so that we're in the same emotional space in order to recognize what needs to be done and i was just looking at this video where someone mentioned this quote by sir david king and sir david king is the former chief scientific advisor to the blair and brown government in the uk and what he said was that we've got three or four years left to save humanity and when he says that he's talking about what needs to be done by the governments so the governments have a three to four year timeline to do something. Now, as activists, we need to be looking at a completely different timeline, which is like, which is that how much time do we need as activists in Vancouver to get to a point where we can push the government to act in a manner that it, within three to four years, they can do something about the climate emergency. And what we're looking at is two degrees of global average temperatures locked in, which means that a lot of the climate catastrophe is already locked in, meaning mass starvation, mass death, and all of that. And historically, what's, what happens is that when people are faced with go tyrannical governments, especially in the global south, they do something that, that's academically called the civil resistance model, which involves going down to the capital cities or the major cities and closing down the major roads. And I don't know if all of you here were on the call with Roger and Strawberry, a few days ago, but one of the things we discussed was that it's very helpful to have the synergy between a movement that's going on in the woods and a movement in the streets, because doing something in the woods is important because the bad things are happening there and it's emotionally very powerful. And the strategic importance of doing stuff in the streets is that you can do it under the windows of the CBC and you can disrupt the city and wake them up to this emergency. And I'll just briefly talk about what, what historically this looks like. And one of the things we were looking at is what was going on during the civil rights movement. And one of the examples during the civil rights movement was that of the Selma, Alabama march. And what happened there was that a bunch of people, a few hundred people went on to this major bridge where they weren't supposed to go to. And the governor at the time said, he, George Wallace, who was a famous racist, he said that, I can't allow this blockade of this bridge to take place because it's going to disrupt the good commuters of Selma, Alabama. And the thing we need to know about that is that that is precisely what is needed to happen in order to raise the profile of the issue to the point where there's a national debate about the climate emergency happening in the city. And someone recently told me, and it made a lot of sense, that in order to be the most popular movement, you need to be the most unpopular movement. And that's how you raise the profile of the issue. And a lot of you may know about the example of a famous suffragette throwing herself in front of the king's horse. And that was an example where 
people sort of, uh, we can look back at it and think of it as something really important and really cool. But if you, if you look at it from a historical point, people at the time were really pissed off because by throwing yourself in front of the king's horse, you're not just throwing yourself in front of the king's horse. What about all the horses coming back, uh, coming behind the king's horse? What about all the people watching? What about all their families? What if someone dies? But all of that needs to happen. And it causes a lot of emotional outrage. But once that emotional outrage goes away, people realize that it's a massive issue and it needs to be addressed. Another example of this was when a thousand people got arrested two years ago in the UK. And when those thousand people got arrested, people, thousands of people were having conversations in their kitchen tables about the climate emergency. And only then did people realize that something drastic needs to happen or in order to make a difference. So we, on starting on the 16th of October, we'll be having two weeks of direct actions on the major intersections and ma on the uh, major bridges of Vancouver leading up to the 25th, uh, which, where we'll be blocking the uh, Vancouver airport. And that's going to cause a national debate about this issue. And it's going to bring the sort of the crisis that we, that we know as activists going on in the woods, but it's going to bring it to the city and it's going to force the entire country to have a debate about what's going on. And just speaking, just a little bit about Ferry Creek, I think I've been hearing people talk about how, you know, so many arrests have happened, but nothing's happened. And the reason for that is that there's a binary tipping point beyond which something does happen. And just to give another example from the civil rights movement, when 400 people went to prison for the Freedom Riders movement, 450, when 450 people went to prison, only then did major legislation take place to desegregate busing in the inner states. Before that, 300 people went to prison, 350 people went to prison, 450 people went to prison. No one cared, right? It was once it reached that tipping point that everything happened. So the reason why I mentioned that is that there's no point in being sort of pessimistic about, oh, it's not working, we've had so many arrests and it doesn't matter. Usually what happens with civil disobedience movements is that thousands of people get arrested, you keep on losing, the police keeps on arresting you, and after a certain point, it's just too many arrests for them to do anything about it. And they have to take you seriously. And we saw this happen in the Global North too, but the, the Yellow Vest protest was that after uh, 10,000 arrests happened in Paris, you were looking at the police going to the government and saying that we're not going to police these protests anymore because it's just too costly for us. And that's ultimately what we're looking at. And that won't happen in October, but we're building to a point where we can get there. So we're going to have this iteration and we're going to have another iteration three months down the line and then three months down the line. And we're going to keep doing that until we get to a point where we can have that impact. And yeah, I'll just briefly talk about nonviolence very briefly. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of research that's been done into the effectiveness of nonviolence and violence. And the thing to know is that if you're a nonviolent civil disobedience movement, we have a 55% likelihood of success based on this research that's been done. And if we, if we act, if you respond violently when the police pushes us or does anything, even verbally, it almost always results in violence taking place. And when you have violence taking place, you bring down the likelihood of success to 25%. So it's a bit of an own goal if we don't maintain nonviolent discipline. And just to give an analogy, when you're at a bus stop and people usually aren't just aren't talking at a bus stop, that's just people not talking. But if you went, go into a room where there are a few Buddhists who are meditating, they're in a state of silence. But there's a difference between not talking and being in a state of silence, just as there's a difference between not being violent and practicing nonviolence. And when you practice nonviolence, you bring out the implicit violence of the government and you make it explicit. So that's what happened at Ferry Creek when people were pepper sprayed. People were being nonviolent, but the police was pepper spraying people and that made national headlines. And because that made national headlines, you had everyone talking about it. And if you know anything about the civil rights movement, and if you've seen the movie Selma, there's a scene there where Martin Luther King goes into a, a hotel and the owner comes in and says he wants to shake his hand. And instead of shaking his hand, he punches him in the face. And then Martin Luther King goes out of the hotel and then he says to his colleague, this is exactly where we need to be. And the reason why he said that was because he was smart about the reason for nonviolence, because he understood, and it was said during nonviolent civil disobedience trainings during the civil rights movement, 
that the purpose of these events is to bring out the implicit violence of the uh, of the state and make it explicit for the whole world to watch and for the whole world to see. Because we know that the implicit violence is there. We know that two degrees is locked in. And we know as activists what that means. We know that that means mass starvation, but the public doesn't know that. And the way the public finds out is if nonviolent people are being arrested for peacefully demonstrating by sitting down on the road, whether whether you're sitting down on the locking road or, or, or on the streets in Vancouver. And just to give another example, a very recent example, and some of you may know this, is that of Insulate Britain. And so they, there's these protests going on in London to demand the insulation of all housing in the UK, which will result in a 15% reduction in carbon emissions. And it's a very small demand, but people have been going on to the M25 highway, their main highway. And in small groups, they're sitting down in front of roads and every day they're getting national headlines and they're bringing sort of the profile of the issue to an ex and they're being able to raise it to an extent where everyone is having to talk about it. And when, when they're asked why they're doing this, they, they talk about the past 30 years of em environmentalism that's involved a lot of good work, but it hasn't been successful. So we've all been doing marches and petitions and rallies, but the simple fact of the matter is that carbon emissions globally have gone up 60%. So we can, for the past 30 years, we can be engaged in really good hard work and it can still empirically be unsuccessful. And we need to, if you're going to recognize what we need to do next, we need to recognize that what, whatever we've been doing for the past 30 years doesn't work. So the sort of crossing the Rubicon is breaking the law. And when you break the law, you put the opposition in a dilemma where they either have to let you get on with what you're doing, whether it's blocking the road or protecting trees, and they'll let you get on with it, in, in which case you get what you want and you get the publicity and you get what you want to accomplish. The alternative they have is to oppress, uh, oppress the people who are protesting. So arresting people, putting them in prison. And when you do that, you win over public sympathy because people are respecting you for having the courage of your convictions and being willing to suffer for your beliefs. And that also requires us to move past uh, an activist sort of dogma for the past 30 years that there's a cost and then there's a benefit and we need to sort of minimize costs and we need to maximize benefits. But the thing to know, the, the thing we learned with the civil rights movement is that there is benefit in the cost itself. So on paper, so many people are getting arrested, so many people are going to prison and it's all bad and we've lost and we've lost the road or we've lost the ground. But in reality, you're inspiring your cultural group and your community by showing them that that's what's needed. And by showing that you're communicating the urgency of the issue, because it won't take anything less than thousands of people getting arrested to solve the greatest crime in human history, right? If you were dealing with littering in your neighborhood, you didn't have to block roads, right? No one's going to block roads because there's littering in your neighborhood. You can just put out a leaflet and you can, it's, that's just la laziness, that's not entr entrenched power. And if you want a 5% wage hike, you also don't have to block roads. You can just maybe go on a strike. But when you're dealing with the biggest crime in human history, with no sight of things slowing down and instead going in the opposite direction and accelerating, the only thing that has any chance of working is doing what you can call high risk, high return actions, which are going to raise a national debate, like closing down the airport, like having thousands of arrests in a concentrated period of time. And even then, there's no guarantee of it working. So the thing to know here is that if you're thinking of getting arrested because it's going to have an impact, historically we know is that what we know is that arrests are only successful if people getting arrested don't care about the consequences. And they don't really care if there's 200 other people or 10 other people or no one else. They're doing it because morally they feel like that's the only thing worth doing. And they couldn't do anything else. I just recently was speaking to someone in Russia who's been involved in environmental protests. And he's been to a Russian prison 25 times for a climate change civil disobedience. And he says now, he's in his 30s, and he says that he doesn't go to a protest anymore unless he's going to prison. And the reason why he's gotten to that state of mind is because he's realized that even him going 25 times to prison isn't enough. And you need hundreds of people who are willing to go to prison. And there's no shortage of a lot of environmental protests happening. And the reason why I keep mentioning this sort of contrast between rallies and civil disobedience is that recently I spoke at the, at the climate strike and just that day, just that morning, I was arrested at the Trans Mountain construction site. 
And then I had to speak there. And it felt morally questionable to be speaking at a place where people aren't doing civil disobedience and you have a thousand people gathered and another place where something simultaneously is happening where sort of people are getting arrested. And it's just this morally interesting question where it's like, we know what we need to do and we aren't mobilizing because we're not telling the truth about what needs to be done. And the fact of the matter is that when you're faced with genocidal governments, which is what this is because you were looking at billions of people in the global south starving to death and dying due to war and other factors because over 30 degrees of global temperature uh, were over 30 de- degrees of temperatures in your uh, in your country in your city you can't grow food you can't grow crops uh, consistently and 2 degrees global average temperatures being locked in means that's already locked in for africa so you're looking at mass starvation in Africa within the next 10, 15, 20 years, or it might be sooner because it's exponential. So the only thing we can do now is uh, recognize and tell the truth that Western governments are now guilty of genocide. And the only responsibility we have now is to enter into civil resistance to the point of arrest. And you obviously as an individual need to come to terms with what that looks like for you, whether it involves sitting down on the roads in Vancouver or, or stopping construction at Ferry Creek or Trans Mountain. But what we're going to be doing on the 16th of October and for two weeks is we're demanding that the government end immediately end all subsidies for fossil fuel projects. And the reason why we're doing it uh, starting on the 16th is because on the 1st of November, uh, the prime minister is going to uh, be in Glasgow in in the UK where COP26 is happening. And if you don't know what COP26 is, uh, that's because for the past 26 years, all these governments have been meeting uh, to discuss climate change and then deciding to do nothing about climate change, which is why this is the 26th conference. And when this is happening, you're looking at hundreds of people are uh, doing civil disobedience in Vancouver and potentially dozens of arrests taking place, if not 100 arrests taking place. So when the prime minister is at COP, everyone's, the whole media is talking about COP and about climate change. And while they're talking about that, they don't have any option but to talk about all the arrests that are taking place in the city because of climate change and the government not acting. So we're demanding that the prime minister immediately ends uh, subsidies for fossil fuels. And if you know anything about a civil disobedience history is that we need to attack nonviolently when the opposition is uh, in a weak position. And when the prime minister is pretending to be good on climate change uh, in Glasgow, that's the time to have many arrests to make him look bad, where he's he's either going to have to justify uh, continuing subsidies or he's, he's going to have to concede to our demands. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it with that. And just in case you didn't know, the federal government gave $18 billion in subsidies for fossil fuel, fossil fuel projects last year. So what we're demanding is a no brainer, which is just for the liberal government to keep up with their election promises. And you can we can absolutely guarantee that that's going to cause a national conversation about fossil fuel subsidies, even if we don't win, that what are we going, doing giving subsidies for fossil fuels? And people are also going to be emotionally aroused because they're not able to get to work or people are just being annoying and people are getting arrested or someone they know is getting arrested. So I'll just I'll just personally encourage people to consider arrest for the October rebellion. Obviously, there are non-arrestable roles. That's a bit of a no-brainer. We're always going to have non-arrestable roles that you uh, that we need people to fulfill. But what we really need people to consider is uh, the importance of risking uh, entering into civil disobedience to the point of arrest. And you won't be alone. We already have a bunch of people who are sort of committed to being arrested. And Laura Laura Lamb is one of them who's going to be giving a testimonial now about the time she got arrested and what that was like. Because uh, most of the barriers people have about getting arrested are mostly psychological. It's mostly people are afraid about what's going to happen and what that looks like emotionally and practically in the moment. So we're going to hear a few people to talk about their arrest situation, uh, starting with Laura. All right, thank you, Zane. Um, yeah, so just before I pass it over to Laura, um, I just want to give everybody a bit of context too. that um, up in Ferry Creek, uh, it is more than a thousand people. I haven't tracked the exact numbers. I think we might be up over 1100 now, 1100 arrests up in Ferry Creek. It was may um, declared the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history. Um, and here in Vancouver, we have had 
um, over 60 arrests um, over the course of our actions. And people have chosen all kinds of reasons um, for why they have decided to get arrested. Um, and it could be uh, for things like putting their privilege on the line um, for, you know, this moral conviction. Um, and some people, it's 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 interesting. It's an interesting experience. So, um, Laura, if you are available to unmute yourself there, I see you, to share why you got arrested and what the experience was like for you. Yeah, hi, I'm Laura, uh, she, her. Um, I've been arrested twice with Extinction Rebellion so far, and I'm planning to get arrested during the October Rebellion. Um, it took me it took me a, a while of working with XR and uh, before I actually took that step. And when I first joined, uh, you know, and I was telling people about civil disobedience, my friends, and they said, are you going to get arrested? And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> because it just seemed like such a getting arrested. Well, wow. but um, actually, it's it's not such a big deal, especially in Vancouver, uh, if you're especially if you're an old white woman. Um, the police are pretty polite. Um, nothing really dreadful happens. You uh, you sit down on the road. Uh, the police start giving announcements about uh, how everybody has to uh, leave the road or else they'll get arrested. Um, and um, most people get up when those uh, announcements happen, get, get out and leave the, ro leave the road. You don't have to, even if you're not going to get arrested. I found that out quite a few times. I, when, even when I'm not getting arrested, I, I just sit there. I sit there until the police come and they tap me on the shoulders and they say, are you wanting to get arrested? Or are, if you don't get up, you're going to get arrested. Are you going to stay here? And then I say no. And I get up and walk away. Um, the, but being arrested, um, when my daughter asked me the first time, what was it like? I said, it, it's sort of like going to the dentist. It's not very pleasant, but you have to do it once in a while. So um, it, they handcuff you. That's not very pleasant. Uh, they put you in uh, the back of a paddy wagon. I mean, uh, that, that's not very pleasant. Sometimes they turn out the lights and there, there's no window. Um, so, uh, and you don't, they take all your stuff away from you. You know, they take, they, they take your, uh, your watch and your phone and your, whatever you happen to be carrying. Um, uh, yeah, try not to be carrying your phone. You're going to learn about that. But, um, you know, they take away your, my hat, <laughs> my, uh, uh, some of my clothes, my bag, and you're sitting there in a paddy wagon for a while, not really knowing what's happening. Uh, they, they search you, they take your picture, they take you to the police station. You might be waiting there for a while in a holding cell. They take your picture again. They give you a, um, a thing to sign saying that recently they've been doing this a lot with the um, Extinction Rebellion arrests, um, promising not to be in a certain area of, of town um, between the arrest and when you go to court. And um, um, after some time, I, the whole process takes less than an hour at, at most. Uh, for the two times that I got arrested, it was, it was probably 45 minutes. And the other time it was probably about 25 minutes. And um, uh, then they let you out. And there's a whole bunch of people there waiting for you with snacks and uh, love and warm wishes and thanks. And, uh, and that's as far as it's gone with me. I haven't had a court date yet. Our, the first uh, time I was supposed to appear, they, they, uh, the, um, the Crown wasn't ready with charges. So that's still up in the air. Uh, yeah, I think that's the end of my testimonial. Amazing, thank you, Laura. Um, we're going to have some more people who will also chime in with their testimonials a little bit later in the session. Um, but I would like to um, pass it over without further ado to Vic um, to introduce himself and um, give us some other uh, information that is useful for all of us who are 
potentially considering arrest. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Vic. I'm a member of the British Columbia Law Union's subgroup called the Movement Support Working Group. And uh, I've been asked to Zane to join you here today to talk a little bit about your civil rights. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about the legal ABCs of getting arrested. I want to begin um, by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the historic and ancestral lands of the Chippewa of the Thames and the Mississaugas of the Credit, also known as the City of Toronto. And I don't know if there was a previous any kind of introduct anything like introductory done, but I'm gonna I'm just gonna jump right into it. Let's keep in mind that what I'm about to say only speaks to any hypothetical future actions. What I'm saying in no way, shape or form should be considered as personal legal advice. So a nonviolent direct action, as it's been described, I know some historic context has been given, but more immediately, the material reality of it is when people decide in a social movement to take a stand and engage in civil disobedience, they risk arrest. Assessing and deciding to risk arrest while it's something that be done effectively as a collective, is a decision I want everyone to take individually. You're stronger and you're more determined in an environmental justice movement when you as an individual come and join in the collective, join with friends with a clear resolve. Understand that there's a whole host of different hypothetical actions, whether a group of friends might choose to approach essential infrastructure like an airport or a bridge or a downtown thoroughfare. That could, that could lead to arrest. Let's, let's be clear that most nonviolent direct actions, when they engage in civil disobedience, present arrestable scenarios. That could be crossing a private or, or private property line. That could be obstructing traffic. That could be immediately interfering with fossil fuel industry, such as construction projects. When you do so, I want everyone to please understand it's a personal decision. Everyone in their own life, in the context of what you're doing leading up to um, the hypothetical October rebellion, please weigh the cost benefit in your own life. And like you would with any sort of professional commitment, please um, be sure to take stock of things that you'll need to do if you won't make it home on said night in case you're in police custody. So if I have a pet, if I have children, if I have a partner, if I have professional commitments. Personal circumstances I'm going to talk about regarding um, medical or, or, or personal trauma, I want to get to a little bit later. But right now, we're just doing a little bit of homework on what you should do before you risk arrest. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize this in four quick points. I tend to talk like this with others, with friends. So you have a little bit of what we call know your rights training. You understand what your civil rights are. You've been talked through with colleagues and comrades about what the arrest process is going to be like. Whether you are planning to get arrested or not, the day that you attend any nonviolent direct action, I would, as a friend, advise you in the strongest terms to have a lawyer or a legal support person that could be a legal buddy available on call that day. And I would please implore you to write their contact information, a phone number, in black permanent marker on a part of your body, preferably an arm or a leg that's easily visible without removing any clothing. We'll get to that in a minute. Often remember though, that when you're subject to arrest, when you're being processed by police, it's a very atomizing experience. I think some brave people have already spoken about their own experiences with police. It's not pleasant. But I want everyone here to remember that when you are risking arrest, when you're arrested, when you're in custody, when you're facing charges, you are not alone. You're part of a movement and people care about you. Most likely XR is gonna have someone track you inside. They're gonna know where you were arrested. They might even have some information, badge number, last name of who arrested you and for what. Now you might ask yourself, why complicate it? Why tell others? Why take part in a collective if I just want to show up 
and get arrested? Well, the reason is to protect yourself and protect the movement. Now, what do I mean by that? If let's say, for example, hypothetically, I show up in the coming weeks and I'm on the front line of nonviolent direct action and I'm taken into custody. If I have any medical needs, if I need to take pills, if I have any essential self-care items on me, remember when I am arrested, they're gonna be seized for me. If I'm being tracked, if I have a buddy, they can contact the police, they can contact whoever has me in custody and can ensure that I, and you have a, you have a right to medical, medical care when you're in custody, can still receive those items. That might seem trivial now, it's not trivial once you're taken into custody and you lose personal autonomy. Why else would I do homework? Why else would we prepare? Why else would we, like I said, weigh the cost benefit analysis? Well, because being arrested and being charged in Canada can have lasting effects on your immigration status, on your employment status, on a whole host of different professional legal entanglements you might have in the future. So it's important to be mindful of that. All I'm really asking you today is to consider your goals in context of the options you have. So let's say, for example, in light of everything I've said today, I still hypothetically, a couple of weeks from now, want to run to the front of a protest line and get arrested. I'm risking arrest. It's the day of. It's the morning. I'm getting ready. What do I bring and what don't I bring? I would tell everyone to please bring and only bring an ID that has your birth date, your legal address, and your first and last name with a photograph, and preferably pen or paper. Things you should leave at home. Absolutely leave your cell phone at home. Leave your wallet at home. Leave anything that is or could be misconstrued as a weapon at home. Misconstrued could mean anything that's pokey anything that might seem rough, anything that might seem 